So yesterday, um, I received an email, an urgent email from my, from my colleague, Cameron, who works at the organisation which I do access, informing me that another human rights activist, a democracy leader, had been arrested in Iran. We scurried not for diplomatic representation or for legal intervention, but to secure her Gmail account. Because we knew that, well, we feared that she would be tortured, not necessarily for her political participation in the events of last year's um, <coughs> response to the Iranian election, but for her password. Because the regime knew and knows that with her password, they have access to her communications, her conversations, and most importantly, her address book. This is what it looked like, and this is one of the images that the regime didn't want the world to see. A cat and mouse game ensued, whereby digital activists and the regime fought to try and with the regime trying to close the internet and the digital activists trying to prise it open. I'm going to show you a couple of images that <clears throat> some of my colleagues helped to get out. And remember that these are the images as you watch them, and I inform you as before we see them that they're quite disturbing, that these were the images that resulted in the President of the United States speaking out. From this election to another, only a few thousand kilometers away, in the same time period, we saw an absolute boon of political participation, lawful participation in new media in Macedonia, where a very interesting thing happened. We could predict the outcome of the election, not by speaking to pundits or to, or to sophologists. This is, the, this is the election results. You can see Ivanov, who has won here, the presidential election. We could determine the outcome before the election took place by looking at the Facebook groups. This is the size of the Facebook groups to almost an accuracy of 1%. Ivanov won 62.48% of the election and 63.2% of his Facebook um, support when you look at it globally. And those individuals were able to bypass the media, bypass the electoral, the electoral system itself to demonstrate that participation. And here to China, where in fact there is actually a very healthy blogosphere, but also more bloggers and cyber dissidents in jail than any other country. This is the first year where there are more um, uh, bloggers and journalists, online journalists in prison than print journalists. This is also the first year anniversary of the first blogger to die in prison. His name is Ahmed Reza. He died on March 18 of last year. And this campaign is a campaign to ensure that the first blogger who died in prison be the last. And whatever we might think of the next country that we're going to visit on our internet freedom tour, We're skeptical, perhaps, of the United States and its foreign policy, but I think these moments are undeniable because the most powerful man in the world swept aside his now Secretary of State to not only win the Democratic nominee, nomination, but to become the most powerful man in the world. Who still doubts that America is a place where all things are possible. Who still questions the power of our democracy. Tonight, is your answer. You made this happen.
and I am forever grateful from the enduring power of our ideals, democracy, liberty, opportunity, and unyielding hope. And how did it happen? $500 million raised online by 6 million people in small denominations of less than $100. 400,000 blog comments, 200,000 events, and 35,000 volunteer groups that all were coordinated online. That's how that man ended up in the White House. So we can see on one side this incredible political participation, this boon which has happened with new technology and Web 2.0, and on the other side, incredible net repression, people being in prison for their activities online, and regimes using that new technology against those dissidents and those human rights activists and those democracy supporters, using it to, to find them, to track them, and to disable them. And here, in our country, our government, in that building, is putting forward voluntarily an internet filtering system, a mandatory one, Well, Chairman Rudd, <laughs> let me show you this because you can actually read it. This is, <laughs> this is the State Council Information Office of the People's Republic of China. And this is a report, a favorable, favorable report of Australia's mandatory filtering regime. But I think we need to remember what happened. In November 2007, it was proposed. You can bring the light. By 2009, it was obvious that it wasn't going to work. Filter has been widely criticised by service providers who say it will be internet censorship compulsory for all Australia. And that will put our level of net censorship alongside places like China, Cuba, Iran and North Korea. I don't want Senator Conroy in my living room telling me how to parent my children or telling me what I can watch on the internet. The internet is a network that magnifies the power and potential of all others. And that's why we believe it's critical that its users are assured certain basic freedoms. Well, let me tell you four things. One, this internet filtering system won't work because if you're trying to stop child pornography, it happens not on websites, it happens with peer-to-peer -peer exchange of files. Secondly, how can you say that the technology that you're developing, tens of million do mil millions of dollars, will not end up, end up in the hands of regimes like China and Burma and Saudi Arabia and United Emirates and Tunisia. The Australian people thirdly do not want this filtering system. 87% of Australians in the Get Up recent poll said that it was the parents' responsibility, not the government's responsibility, to manage a child's behaviour online. And finally, because of those regimes, like Iran and China, there is a thriving circumvention industry. It's massive. Every 14-year-old kid knows how to jump the firewall in Australia because we have a very savvy population here. But in Iran, it's a different story, and I've put together this video to show you how to jump the firewall. <laughs> Taken with a handheld camera. A mobile phone, I should say. Trying to get it to YouTube. The firewall comes in, and here we go. To go between computers, one, two, three, four, five, six, and over to YouTube. Bang, it hits, and that video that would have ended up staying in someone's camera. We're sent to the rest of the world. And it's the same principle here in Australia. Caroline from Campbelltown, Campbelltown will be able to work it out. But yes, we must deal with the, principle, the, the, the problem of child pornography, undoubtedly, but we should be dealing with it in exactly the same way that we deal with it offline, with parenting, with policing, and with education. Because what's at stake here is a principle. 
the principle of freedom of information, of the right to expression, political expression, and to hold an opinion without interference across media and across borders. This is what Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says. This is not a disconnected internet. This is one internet. And if Australia chops off a pinky, and Iran chops off a hand, and if China chops off a leg, and if American corporates chop off an arm, what do we have left? We are living in a democracy. We should be standing up for the rights of internet freedom, for digital freedom, for political participation, and to end the, and to, to end the digital divide. And that's what my organisation does. We are building a new global movement for digital freedom. We have built already a digital relief team that helps people on the other side of the firewall. And we're developing policy entrepreneurship around digital rights and internet freedom. But a closed internet is not just a threat to political participation. I believe it's actually a threat to global security. And I'm talking about cyber warfare. Because despite the fact that we don't see it, it's happening. We've seen it with Google and China. We've seen it in the 2008 uh, attack between, or the war between Georgia and Russia. When Russia first went in, they didn't send in the tanks. They sent in the code. And maybe it wasn't Russia. Maybe it was patriotic hackers. But the fact is that we don't necessarily know who the attackers are because they have stealth, they have anonymity, they have unpredictability. And we, there's no international law that governs cyber warfare. No Hague, no customary international law, no precedent. But in fact, in reality, there's precedent. So, for, ladies and gentlemen, for too long, I would posit that the internet, the virtual world, and the so-called real world have been seen as two separate spheres. Isn't it time that we bring them together? Isn't it time that those um, rights of freedom of expression, freedom of opinion, the right to hold an opinion, the right to seek and impart information, which are the wellspring of all other rights in our offline world, become, have prime, become and have primacy in our online world. This is the internet. And this is the cosmos. We have an opportunity to combine them, to take the best of both of those worlds, so that Caroline in Campbelltown and Omid Rezas, the Omid Rezas of the world, don't live in a space which is strangled with restrictions, with walls and with surveillance, but live in a space which has opportunity, promise and opportunity. We do have a choice. We can decide whether to be limited by the worst and pander to it, or combine the best of both worlds and live in a place which has hope, opportunity and promise. Thank you.